Let's see how to use the data of an acyclic partial matching in order to build the small Morse complex that was promised at the end of the previous lecture. Uh, the setup is not going to be surprising. Let k be a simplicial complex and let sigma be an acyclic partial matching on k. Uh, for convenience of notation, I'm going to take the liberty of writing uh, for any pair of uh, simplices sigma and tau and k. Uh, let's write this uh, tau colon sigma, I'm going to call this, uh, I don't know, incidence number. Uh, this is something in zero or plus minus one uh, to indicate the uh, coefficient of sigma in the boundary of tau. So assume that the vertices of k are ordered so that this actually makes sense. Um, and so you have a boundary map, um, a simplicial boundary map of tau. And then if um, uh, sigma is an odd or even face of tau, then you get uh, plus or minus 1 the other way, minus or plus 1. And if sigma is not a face of tau at all, then you get a 0. So this, this incidence number is uh, non-zero only when uh, sigma is a co-dimension 1 face of tau. Um, good. So the, the way to define the boundary operator uh, for the Morse chain complex is to assign to each sigma path um, an algebraic contribution, a weight. Uh, so here's the definition of that weight. Um, the weight of a sigma path, uh, and maybe we've all forgotten what a sigma path looks like, but here it is. So sigma 1, tau 1, sigma 2, tau 2, all the way to sigma m, tau m. So that's the entire um, path. And um, the requirement, if you remember, was that this would, uh, in the matching, basically partial matching, uh, all the all the backward pointing, the less thans, were going to be in, uh, in the partial matching. So this is the number uh, w of, uh, of rho. And this is going to be either plus or minus 1 in whatever field you're uh, choosing to work in, uh, given by. And now uh, I'm going to write down something complicated, but you should not think of it as anything complicated. Um, uh, it's, um, uh, it's all being generated by a simple rule. When, when you look at a less than, then you have an incidence number that is tau bigger than sigma, so tau colon sigma. Whenever you see a less than sign the way we have in the first pair, um, you um, you write that with a negative reciprocal. And whenever you see a greater than sign, as you see for tau 1 next to sigma 2, you write down the ordinary incidence number. Uh, so let's write this down. Uh, minus 1 over the tau 1 sigma 1 incidence multiplied by tau 2 sigma 1. Uh, sorry, other way around. Tau 1 sigma 2 multiplied by minus 1 over tau 2 sigma 2. And if you keep dancing this dance, every time you see a uh, less than, you put a negative reciprocal. So for every uh, sigma pair, its incidence number gets thrown in the denominator with a minus sign. And every time you don't have a sigma pair, like tau i next to sigma i plus 1, uh, you just put in the ordinary um, incidence. So this penultimate term, I think, is going to be tau m minus 1 colon sigma m. And then the last one is minus 1 over tau m sigma m. So this is some uh, weird uh, looking product. But what's nice about it is that this is always in plus or minus 1 because you're multiplying a whole bunch of um, numbers. And uh, because of the um, of the requirement that they're all co-dimension 1 faces of each other, that's how you define a sigma path, everything is plus or minus 1. Everything in the square brackets is plus or minus 1, so it's a product of pluses and minus 1s, um, and, and therefore it is um, uh, something quite uh, reasonable. Now, um, uh, this is the weight of a path, and this is going to uh, be, be used to define our boundary operator. So before I define that, uh, I want everyone to be on the same page. So uh, the Morse complex has chain groups 
which were defined in the previous lecture. So uh, for all uh, dimensions k bigger than zero, the kth Morse complex chain group is the direct sum over some copies of your ground field. And what is it indexed by? Uh, it's indexed by all simplices alpha that happen to be unpaired. So these are the critical simplices of dimension uh, uh, k. So, um, so what we need is a linear map connecting uh, k-dimensional critical simplices to the k-1-dimensional critical simplices. And that's going to be provided by imposing these weights on sigma paths. So here is... Um, uh, here is a definition of the Morse boundary operator that was uh, that was promised. So um, the Morse boundary operator uh, dk sigma. This goes from the vector space generated by the k-dimensional critical cells to the vector space generated by the k minus one-dimensional critical cells um, has uh, the easiest way to define it is in terms of a matrix representation. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, um, so the basis for uh, its domain is the uh, is the k-dimensional critical cell. So if I write this um, as a matrix, um, so I'm going to have some alpha here. Uh, and alpha has uh, dimension equal to k and maybe i'll write uh, some omega here and uh, dimension of omega is k minus uh, one and of course uh, the important thing is that they're both critical otherwise they would not be in the basis of the domain or the codomain so once you've picked out these um these cells i mean the the, the important thing um is what goes here and i'm going to call that entry alpha omega same uh I mean, this is the same notation that we're using for the simplicial boundary, but I'll put a little sigma here to indicate that this is the Morse boundary uh, associated to the acyclic partial matching sigma. Uh, so this matrix is completely described if I tell you what goes in uh, that a alpha uh, omega. So that entry of this matrix is defined to be uh, the original incidence. So this is zero if omega is a co-dimension one face of alpha or plus or minus one otherwise. So this part is easy. This is what the simplicial complex would have recorded as the boundary operator entry of alpha and omega anyway. Um, plus stranger stuff. Um, so there's going to be a sum over all um, sigma paths. So that start with sigma one and then um, end at tau n. Uh, so this is uh, sum over all sigma paths, rho, um, and, and of the following number. So um, you take the critical cell, uh, the critical simplex alpha, and then compute its incidence with sigma 1. Then you take the weight of the path, and then you multiply it with the last thing in the path, uh, incidence number with uh, omega. So um, this is a complete um, description. I promise um, I will explain the, the, uh, the reason for this formula later. So for now, just think about it as, um, as, uh, as something, um, just an algebraic expression. I will try and explain what this means and why um, this particular sum over paths of multiplicity, you know, these, these weights, uh, will appear in this formula. Um, the, the, I think the most important thing to note is that uh, we only need to sum over um, uh, a few sigma paths to compute uh, this alpha uh, omega coefficient, the entry in the matrix. I mean, the reason for that is if you go back to this um, contribution of each row, this, this triple product, um, the, the weight of rho is always plus or minus one. But this term and this initial term, alpha coefficient with sigma one, 
and the last term tau m coefficient with omega um, those are only allowed to be non-zero if sigma one is a co-dimension one face of alpha and if omega is a co-dimension one face of tau m uh, right so uh, so only the row uh, sigma one tau one uh, tau m uh, satisfying um, this condition will count. I mean, you have to have um, um, the alpha must have sigma one as a face, and then of course you have the entire path row that ends at tau m, and then tau m must have uh, omega as a face. So this is your row in the middle, and um, and it's really counting. Um, these paths that flow in this zigzag way from alpha to omega. And let me quickly um, say a little bit about um, geometrically what that looks like. So um, here's a perfectly good acyclic partial matching on a simplicial complex that looks very, very much uh, like a circle. So, so here are the, uh, I've drawn all the arrows. And you can look at this, this edge is uh, unpaired with anything. So it's, uh, it's critical. And that vertex is unpaired with anything and it's critical. And if you try to build the Morse complex uh, for this example, so maybe we can just um, uh, move it to the side and make this an example on its own. Um, so here's an example. So K is the circle and sigma is the system of red arrows and the blue cells that have been highlighted, the edge and the vertex are critical. The Morse complex is going to be, um, uh, so in dimension um, zero, you only have one critical cell. So let's call this uh, alpha and let's call this uh, omega. So this is generated by alpha. Uh, sorry, omega, because it's zero-dimensional, uh, omega. And uh, then you have another here. This is generated by alpha, and everything else is zero. Um, and there's just a single uh, number here that we have to work out. The entire boundary map is just a single number, d. And the way you get that d um, is uh, you want to find the coefficient uh, here, and what you have to do is look at alpha, then look at um, its boundary, that's sigma one. So all paths going from the boundary of, sig uh, of alpha that end up at omega. So this is going to be one path over here, and that's going to be another path over here. And um, well, because we know the homology of the circle, um, d is not equal to zero in this case. So there's a rank, uh, sorry, d is exactly equal to zero in this case. So there's a, uh, there's a zero map. And if you use this baby chain complex with one um, dimensional chain group in dimension zero and one, and zeros everywhere else, you get the right homology of the circle. Whereas if you'd use the original simplicial uh, chain complex, Think about uh, how many vertices and edges you would have had. I mean, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six. So that instead of f would have been f to the sixth, and there's one, two, three, four, five, and this would have been some sort of uh, is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six. No, so it would have been a six by six matrix that you'd have to sort of manipulate with row and column operations. Uh, and here with the Morse complex, there's no work to do. I mean, this f map being by zero to f. So you just count the dimensions and those are the homology groups. So this is fantastic in terms of simplifying computation and just how many cells you can, you know, these simplices you can just trash uh, and still get uh, the right homology. Um, so, so at least, um, uh, you know, whether, whether this uh, ridiculous formula makes sense or not, at least the structure of how these gradient paths are flowing between critical cells and contributing uh, entries to the boundary operator should be relatively, um, uh, at least intuitive, if not obvious. Okay, so the main um, thing that I want to prove here is the fact that the thing we call the boundary operator is actually a boundary operator. 
So uh, dk sigma composed with dk plus 1 sigma equals 0, um, i.e. the Morse complex, the Morse chain complex, is actually a chain complex. Therefore, it has a well-defined sequence of homology groups. Um, and the proof of this result is uh, it's a bit of a calculation, um, but, but I think it's, uh, it's good to at least um, set it up. Uh, so by induction, um, it suffices to consider uh, the case where sigma has only one pair. Because you can uh, you can just keep doing this one pair at a time, uh, and so because sigma has only one pair, there's only one possible gradient path, which is the one I've written right there. Sigma less than tau. That's it. No other gradient paths are allowed. Um, okay. So um, so we want to show that for all. Um, uh, critical cells, let's say alpha and omega uh, critical simplices, we have, um, let's call it B. Uh, this is the sum over all C critical uh, of uh, alpha C sigma multiplied by xi omega sigma uh, this is equal to zero so this is what we want to show um, okay so instead of we have i should say we want to show that this um, sum over all the critical simplices uh, alpha xi um, multiplied by xi omega is uh, zero and that goes back to how this matrix was defined. I mean, we're taking the dot product of uh, some things row and then some things column. Um, so, um, so good. Now, um, let's write, uh, to simplify life a little, uh, we'll write each sum and as a contribution of uh, this elk C. So this is um, one entry of this uh, giant product matrix. Uh, so this is going to be uh, just the sum and that shows up here. Okay, now um, if you go back to the formula for the for the boundary operator, it takes a little bit of scrolling. So you see it right at the top of the screen here. It's going to be the usual boundary plus the sum over paths term. Um, and the sum over paths term is particularly easy right now because there's only one path to sum over, which is sigma less than tau. So if you um, take a bit of a deep breath and write this out, we're going to get the usual simplicial incidence minus alpha sigma multiplied by tau xi um, divided by uh, tau sigma. So that's the that's the Morse boundary uh, coefficient for um, alpha with respect to xi, and then the one for xi with respect to um, omega is this minus uh, xi sigma multiplied by uh, tau omega divided by tau sigma. Not fun. This does not look like fun, but. What I want to say here is that the product of these two is zero. And the reason for that is you take a step back and think about um, what makes um, what makes this numerator not zero. And remember, this is uh, a, this has to be co-dimension one if this thing is zero. So this term tau colon c is only allowed to be positive if uh, or not positive but non-zero if the dimension of xi is one less than the dimension of tau which is to say that the dimension of xi has to be the same as the dimension of sigma on the other hand here you have xi um, colon sigma and so if this term is non-zero then the dimension of xi should be one plus the dimension of sigma 
or the dimension of tau. Now, the dimension of tau and sigma differ by ones, and C cannot be the same dimension as both. So at most, one of these terms makes it to the next round when you multiply this out. Um, so we only get three terms uh, from this. So this is alpha C, C double, uh, omega, minus alpha C, uh, alpha sigma, tau C divided by tau sigma. So this is the, the second thing I've written down here is a product of this term with the, um, oops, no, that's not the right thing. Let me get rid of it. Uh, so I wanted to multiply this first term with that last term, and that should give you C sigma tau omega divided by tau sigma minus one final term, which you get by multiplying this complicated one with this simple one, which is um, alpha sigma tau C C omega divided by tau sigma. Wow, what a pain. Um, but things become much, much nicer. Um, since the original simplicial uh, uh, boundary uh, is a boundary uh, is uh, a boundary map, is a boundary operator, we know that um, the sum of a, b, b, c uh, over all b equals zero for all a, b, c in k. Um, so use this to get uh, that the sum over c of b, c equals zero. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, remember we're not summing over all the, um, all the simplices. C is all the critical simplices, so it's going to be everything minus sigma and tau. So when you sum this over C, um, you should you would almost get zero, except there will be two terms that are missing. So this will be um, when you plug in C equals sigma and C equals tau. So this is going to be the sum of two such terms, and then when you sum this over all C, one of those terms gets taken away, and when you sum that over all C, uh, the second term gets taken away. So this entire thing is zero. Um, and therefore B, uh, which was a sum over Cs of all BC, will vanish. So that's the proof that this is a boundary operator. So I left a little bit at the end, which is not so bad. So this stuff is uh, maybe an exercise. Okay, so um, maybe we're not very happy with this um, boundary operator um, definition because it's weird and complicated. In the next lecture, I promise um, this formula will become much, much clearer about why we're summing over all paths. For now, though, um, let's do a um, more complicated uh, example of an acyclic partial matching and sort of build the most complex ourselves. So this is going to be on, um, uh, let's see, maybe a torus or a crying bottle. I never know which one to try. So let's try uh, a torus. So, I am currently attempting to draw a torus, not the kind that you would uh, see in an in a ordinary point set topology class, but definitely the kind that you would see in an algebraic topology class. So we're triangulating the torus very, very badly. Uh, synthesis here, synthesis there. Um, okay, that's roughly a torus. Uh, and why is this a torus, this square looking object? Well, it's a torus because we have the opposite sides identified. So that point is all those four points are copies of A. And then let's write BC here, which is the same as BC there, DE here, DE here. And the rule for how to build um, an acyclic partial matching is very simple. <coughs> the, the, there's only two steps. The, the first step is um, you make a lowest dimensional simplex critical. And the second one is uh, 
make pairings when uh, no alternative remains. Uh, I will explain the meaning of both these um, in a second. In fact, let's just let's just build a cyclic partial matching. So the first thing we want to do is find a simplex of lowest available dimension. The lowest available dimension right now is zero with tons of vertices that are still there. Let's even name all of them. So this is F, G, H, and I. So now you have a full set of vertices, tons of them. Um, and let's just take the first one alphabetically. So this A is now considered critical. And so we've executed uh, step one once. We've taken a lowest dimensional simplex and made it critical. And now what this two means is if you look around um, uh, the, the edges that had A as a vertex, um, if A is forced to be critical, that means that those edges cannot be paired with A because uh, if A was paired with something, it wouldn't be critical. That means they have only one other vertex that they could possibly be paired with. So make that pairing. So for instance, this edge AD and the vertex D, there's no choice. Um, AD cannot pair with A, so it must pair with D. And you have to be mindful that there are two copies. So that's one pairing. Similarly for E, um, there's E and AE have no choice but to pair with each other. Uh, C and AC have no choice but to pair with each other. We're still doing step two over and over because we have pairs available to make. So um, you can get a little bit more exotic. So F and A will pair, uh, B and A will pair, um, take two copies of that. And so um, what else can we pair? Well, if you look at um, um, the, this, this edge, um, IE, uh, it could have paired with E or it could have paired with I. But E is already taken, um, so uh, you you can just pair it. The only available thing to pair that edge with is I. And of course, you had a few choices there, but that's um, that's neither here nor there. And now, if you take a look, for the same reason, G will also be paired with something. Uh, it could have gone left, but but it doesn't matter. So we'll make H go straight to A as required. Okay. Uh, at this point, if you take a look, all the vertices have disappeared. Every vertex is either critical, which is A, or every other vertex is paired with an edge. Um, it might seem that this is all the pairings that we can make, but that's not the case. Um, for instance, if you look at the lower left corner, there is a two simplex. Here it is, ABF, and it's lost two of its edges to pairings, but it does have this wonderful edge BF available. Uh, to pair with. So you can make another pairing. All of these pairings that we're making are a consequence of the fact that A was critical and therefore not available for pairing with any of the things around it. So here's another simplex with no choice. Uh, here's another simplex with no choice about who to pair with. Um, and I think we're at the end of the line. So now if you take a look at any of the one-dimensional simplices or the two-dimensional simplices, you will see that, that you, have, um, uh, you have alternatives. So there is no canonical pairing that's possible. If you look at BC, this is a face of BCG, and it's also a face of BCI on the other side. So it's not like you can pair it in because there is an alternative available. This rule 2 does not apply. Similarly, this edge FH, you can directly see the two higher dimensional simplices. Every simplex that's remaining, two simplex that's remaining, uh, maybe I forgot this one, um, has at least one, um, uh, has at least two faces, two edges remaining. So it looks like we're stuck. Um, so we go back to step one and we make a lowest dimensional simplex critical. So now we have to choose an edge. And um, alphabetically, I guess it makes sense to choose, uh, let's use another color, BC, as critical. So now BC is critical, and uh, you immediately see in the two simplices around it, um, here it is, so BCI, that's one two simplex, and uh, BGC. Uh, if BC is unavailable for pairing with, then uh, we, we have 
only one candidate each. And the minute that edge disappears, you have only that candidate here. Okay, and now again, we're stuck. So we are forced to choose um, a third uh, critical cell. So I'll choose DE. And now for the same reason, pairings happen here and here. And in fact, this time we can go a little bit further. So this one also disappears. And now we have this one um, two-dimensional simplex FHI, um, all of whose edges have flown off to be paired with other things. And so this guy must be critical. So I'll mark it as, uh, I don't know, uh, just shade it, I guess, as, as critical. Okay. And now, you, let's say you want to compute the Morse chain complex with this acyclic partial matching that we built using our two very, very simple rules that are written on the right of the screen. Um, so first, we need the number of zero-dimensional critical cells. Well, we only ever chose one. That was A. So the zero-dimensional chain group is just F. Uh, how many one-dimensional critical cells? Well, there's BC on the left, right, and then DE at the top bottom, so two. How many two-dimensional critical cells? Well, it's just the one that I've scrawled all over, so it's FHI, and that's it. Okay, now we, um, we need to use the sum over paths formula to find some matrix here and some matrix here. Uh, the first one is going to send F to F2, and the second one is going to send F2 to F, so that's why the first one is tall and skinny, and the second one is short and fat. Um, well, uh, to really get those numbers right, we'd have to assign plus or minus one orientations to, um, to everything, right? We'd have to order the simplices and then worry about plus or minus, so I don't want to do that. So let's just say we're doing things over Z mod 2. Uh, and then you just get to count how many paths there are, because uh, plus and minus one are exactly the same number in Z mod two. They're one. So um, let's zoom out a bit and take a look at this uh, picture. Now, um, to get the entries um, of of this first uh, boundary map, you just take a look at each of your critical syntheses, one syntheses. So here's BC and count the number of um, gradient paths from the boundary of BC down to A. And you see there's exactly two. You can take BC down to C, up to AC, down to A. That's one. And it, there's a mirror copy of it on the other side, but that's the same path. And similarly down here, you can go from BC down to B, up to BA, down to A. So that's one path down, one path up. And so that gives you a big fat zero because uh, two mod two is zero. Similarly, DE has one left path to A and one right path to A. So that's zero. Um, so that's just the zero matrix. Easy. Uh, if you want to build, uh, similarly, the boundary operator over here, you take the two-dimensional critical cell that we have and count the paths down to the one-dimensional critical cells. And you can trace the orange arrows to get to DE upwards or downwards. So there's two paths there. So that's going to be a zero. And um, similarly, how many paths to um, to BC? Well, take the orange arrow, but then there's the blue ones. And then here, there's directly the blue ones. So there's a left path and a right path. And so again, you get zero. And this is the easiest chain complex on the planet if you want to compute um, homology. Uh, all the boundary maps are zero. So the kernels are everything. The images are nothing, which means that the chain groups are exactly the homology groups. And indeed, um, this is the correct homology of the torus. I want you to stare at this simplicial complex um, uh, that's illustrated here. Think about how many edges, how many two simplices, how big, how absolutely enormous this chain complex would be if you hadn't made all these reductions, and how wonderfully simple it is now that you have made the reductions. So I realize this is not a proof that we got the homology of the torus right. We still have to actually prove that this small chain complex works no matter what acyclic partial matching you impose on what simplicial complex. So that proof is going to be the subject of the next lecture. See you there.